Welcome. Welcome to the HPL seminar series. So um, today I'm really happy to um, introduce Dr. Sean Gallagher from um, Auburn University. So uh, Dr. Gallagher and I have been sort of emailing through correspondence for the last couple of years and we've got a lot of common interests <laughs> in the area of mechanical fatigue. Can we get rid of that echo? Is it the TV? Is, is it gone now? It's gone now. So a lot of common area, uh, common areas of interest in, uh, in, in, in mechanical fatigue, whereas I'm primarily focused on sports injury. He'll be talking today about um, workplace injury. Um, Dr. Gallagher has a really interesting background and took several different turns to, to get him here. So he's got an undergraduate degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in music with a specialization in guitar. And then he spent some years as a professional musician, struggling professional musician. And then Is there he, any other kind? Yeah. <laughs> and he got a degree in physical education from Penn State, Penn State University in exercise physiology. And his research topic was the effect of hot air breathing on the temperature of the tongue and hard palate. Right? Yep. Um, after that, Dr. Gallagher worked um, in, the, in, a, in an ergonomics lab, kind of ran the ergonomics lab in mining at the United States Bureau of Mines, which later became uh, part of NIOSH, right? mm -hmm. which is the National Institute for Occupational uh, Safety and Health. And then and after that, he did a PhD in industrial engineering at Ohio State with uh, Bill Maris and the research his research there was the effect of flexion on fatigue failure of the lumbar spine, which I'm sure has kind of <clears throat> brought him to his, his current area of research today, which is really focused on the use of mechanical fatigue principles to assess the risk um, for uh, workplace um, musculoskeletal disorders. Um, just a few fun facts. He's a fairly accomplished guitarist. I would hope so after I didn't, specialization. I didn't bring one. I didn't bring one. <laughs> and, uh, and was a very good, he says pretty good, soccer player um, in, in high school, where his high school team won the state championship. Was that North Carolina State? North Carolina, yes. Okay. All right. Well, that being said, um, I'll let Dr. Gallagher take it away from here with his talk entitled Musculoskeletal Disorders as a Fatigue Failure Process. Thank you. Now, I might call these things musculoskeletal injuries, but think musculoskeletal, okay? So, you know, for a long time, the ergonomics field has kind of known, you know, has been studying musculoskeletal injuries, and what, what we found is that, that there were four main physical risk factors for these injuries or disorders. And, you know, these are only the physical ones. There are also, you know, some psychosocial issues which are associated with the development of these disorders. And, but the ones that were, that, that are the common, the big four physical risk factors include exposure to excessive force, uh, highly repetitive activities, awkward postures or non-neutral postures, and exposure to vibration. And that can either be whole body vibration, like you're riding along the road in a truck or something over potholes. Do you have potholes up here? Yeah, I figured you probably had some. Uh, in Alabama, we don't have very many. But at any rate, you know, or you can have hand-arm vibration. And, and all of those we knew were associated with, with the development of, of MSDs. So the, the thing is that really for, for a long time, uh, these risk factors 
were really treated as though they acted in an independent fashion and and in an additive way. And so there were a couple of large scale epidemiology studies that were done, one in 1997 by NIOSH and the other by the National Research Council Institute of Medicine. Um, and they did a couple of large scale reviews on the epidemiology and they looked at the four risk factors, but they you know, didn't note that you know, there was really any you know, interaction going on between these risk factors. So also the uh, exposure assessment tools that have been developed for, for musculoskeletal disorders uh, really didn't account for any interaction between these, these risk factors. So I, I remember, you know, I was walking out of a conference room when I was working at NIOSH one day, and I, I had this, this study in mind. This is a classic study by, by Tom Ander, Tom Armstrong, I'm sorry, and uh, Barbara Silverstein, uh, from the University of Michigan. And what it was was uh, looking at the effects of force and repetition on hand wrist tendonitis. And so you see a certain pattern of activity here in terms of the, the uh, outcomes in terms of hand wrist tendonitis. You see that with low force and low repetition, we'll consider that kind of the referent condition. And you would have an odds ratio of one. And if you look at low force and high repetition, you see a modest increase in the risk. If you have high force and low repetition, you have something that's usually a little higher than the low force high repetition. And then with high force and high repetition, you see a dramatic increase in risk. So I was thinking of that one day, and you know, I had already done my dissertation where I was crushing spines, you know, using a fatigue failure thing. So I was familiar with what an SN curve looked like. And I was walking out of this conference room and I said to myself, you know what, this is exactly the pattern that you would expect if there was a fatigue failure process going on and actually causing these injuries. So this is, you know, one example of a fatigue failure curve or SN curve. And of course, you know, many of you know, okay, you have for any tissue, you know, there's going to be this one cycle ultimate stress that the, um, that the tissue can take uh, and it'll break in one cycle. Okay, you can still get that material to fail, whatever it is, at 80% of that ultimate stress level, but it may take 100 cycles or so to do so. And if you lower it to 50%, you know, maybe you go 1,000 cycles or so and so forth. And if you get low enough, obviously, uh, you know, you're going to be able to go many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of cycles. And for, for many, for, you know, many uh, uh, tissue, uh, you know, not tissues, but materials, there's an endurance limit somewhere around 30% where, you know, you can keep loading it pretty much indefinitely. I don't, you know, musculoskeletal tissues don't necessarily show this, this endurance limit, but we've got healing on our side. So, so at any rate, that pattern that I just showed of, of, of interaction is kind of what you expect to see. So I kind of put the quadrants up here. So low force, low repetition, well below the fatigue failure curve. You would not expect to have a lot of action in terms of musculoskeletal injuries there. Low force, high repetition, well, depends on, you know, how high the low force is and how many repetitions you have, but you would expect to see somewhat of an increase because you know, the fatigue failure curve is, is diving down at that point and you may, you know, come in contact with that. High force, low repetition, you know, again, you know, probably a little bit higher than the low force, high repetition is what you would expect because there's, you know, some uh, uh, 
exposure there in terms of the in terms of the curve and then the high force high repetition you know that's going to be you know you know pretty certain that you're going to run into this fatigue feather curve so if you think about the this pattern that we saw uh, that's exactly what you would expect if you had kind of this decreasing exponential function in terms of uh, stress and the number of cycles performed. So I was interested and said, hey, um, you know, I wonder if anybody else has found this. And so we did a, a number of, a look at many different studies. This is uh, also by Silverstein, kind of uh, in the same group, you know, doing a study on carpal tunnel syndrome. And we see the same type of pattern happening there. We, we actually were able to get the data from this study. They, they actually didn't look as to whether there was a force repetition interaction with this one. But this is for low back injuries. And, you know, again, we see, you know, the same type of pattern. This is for lateral epicondylitis in a, in a study by Haar and Anderson in 2003. You know, and you can see the pattern that's, that's occurring here. So this pattern is really indicative of something happening with an exponential curve like, like that. You know, it's like it really makes sense that it's a fatigue failure process. So we actually found 12 studies that looked at, you know, epidemiology, uh, in, including a force by repetition interaction. And these were either studies that were published or whether we could get the data and actually uh, do the analysis ourselves. We found, found very similar patterns of, of, of interactions, and we found it for low back disorders, carpal tunnel, hand wrist tendonitis, nerve conduction, signal latency, which is a test for carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, wrist discomfort, lateral epicondylitis, shoulder tendonitis, shoulder discomfort, and knee discomfort. So that covers, you know, uh, a whole lot of joints there. But, and, well, I, I won't get into that. So, and there's lots of other reasons to believe that, that these injuries are due to a fatigue failure process. One is, you know, certainly in vitro tests on biomaterials all demonstrate a fatigue failure process. Uh, there have also been some animal studies that have been done that have shown both tissue pathology and cytokine expression um, cytokine expression is kind of indicative of, of the, the, the amount of damage that's being done to tissues, consistent with a fatigue failure process. Uh, and there's even been, you know, a demonstration of fatigue failure process in vivo in a mouse model by Andres Puri and Fladel. And also, as I'll get to later, if you use fatigue failure based risk assessment tools, find it has a very high correspondence to risk of, of injury. Okay, so, so here's kind of how they test material uh, failure with, you know, um, in, a, in a fully reverse loading situation. Okay, this is how they test metals and plastics and those types of things. So, so it goes into tension, compression, tension, compression, tension, compression. Okay, so that's usually how metals and plastics are tested. Now, I don't think that musculoskeletal tissues are ever really tested, uh, you know, experience this. I mean, you, you could do it kind of artificially in vivo, but usually we don't see this kind of loading where you go into tension and compression like this. So, this is something that we do see in the body. And you can see that one thing that happens is that the, the mean stress, so this is a stress curve, the mean stress is gonna be no longer zero as it was with the fully reverse loading that I showed before. So that adds a little bit you know, to the stress on the tissues. And this is something like tendons would, would show in, in, uh, in vivo. It's been estimated that when a, when a tendon is, is relaxed, you know, there, there's only about a newton or so, you know, a very small amount of force 
on the tendon. But then it will get cyclically loaded as you do, for example, what I'm interested in is the occupational work tasks. Um, so you'll get that kind of thing with tendons. <clears throat> and then, well, it's not intention, but, you know, we will see something called fluctuating stress in a tissue like the low back and the spine. So here, you know, I would be starting in compression right now. I've probably got about, you know, 500 newtons of, of loading on my spine. And then if I started doing lifting tasks, I would be getting, you know, increased loading. So here the mean stress is also going to be higher and, uh, you know, the, the absolute, you know, stresses are going to be higher as well. So these are the types of things that we think are happening. Now, how does fatigue failure actually, you know, take place? Well, you have something like a spine, people are doing lifting tasks, they're getting cyclic loading. You know, then a micro crack appears in their vertebral end plate, for example. And with repeated loading, that there's going to be cracks that start to develop or damage that starts to develop that starts to radiate out from that first area of microfracture. And eventually, this can be sufficient enough that, you know, the, the entire structure may be at risk of damage. So, you know, this is kind of what we're talking about, you know, and it will happen differently in different tissues. You know, in the vertebral end plate, we see this kind of pattern quite frequently. But, you know, with tendons, they tend to come apart in a different, in different, uh, in a different fashion. Uh, it's kind of more of a fretting fatigue situation. So, so in our field, you know, people haven't really thought about fatigue failure as as a as an etiological factor in musculoskeletal disorders for a long time. So I wanted to talk about some of the implications associated with this. Um, uh, some of the some of the implications are first. One of the things, nice things about fatigue failure is it has a method for assessing highly variable loading regimens and kind of adding up the damage associated with each and coming up with a, a sum of the cumulative damage that might happen, for example, during a work day. Um, you know, that, that ability, I'm kind of, I kind of call it the holy grail. It's been, it's been something that we've been looking for in ergonomics for a long time. Like, how do you combine the effects of highly variable cumulative loading? It's like nobody really had a good answer for that. Fatigue failure theory provides methods of doing that. Uh, it allows for models that can potentially incorporate damage as well as the healing process of the body. We'll talk about that. Uh, it identifies that there is a huge role played in terms of individual characteristics. I mean, humans are biologically extremely variable. And, you know, we have in our, in our room here, we've got a lot, of, a lot of people, they, for example, might all have different spine strength. I mean, I'm sure everybody here probably has a different spine strength. If we compressed your spine, crushed it, you know, it would take different amounts of, you know, force or stress to, to do that. I'm not going to do that, but, but you have to realize that because of this, if somebody, you know, had everybody do a lifting task that, it, that loaded your, everybody's spine in the same way, people would be accruing damage at different rates, okay? And so, Individual characteristics can play a huge role, we believe, in terms of the development of these disorders. <clears throat> and um, it allows for the development of risk assessment tools based on fatigue failure principles. And by the way, if there, if there are any questions, I meant to say this before I started, but, you know, feel free to, to chime in, you know, asking a question at any point. Okay. So fatigue failure provides a unifying par paradigm for understanding all of the physical risk factors associated with musculoskeletal disorders. We can't do psychosocial, but force and repetition I already talked about before, okay, and that interaction that you would expect 
with a deep fair process. But what about adopting awkward postures? Well, awkward postures in, in many ways would result in kind of this situation, okay? You're in a neutral posture, you've got some kind of load on, on the body. For example, say I was gonna do a lifting task. I start straight up, I'm in a neutral posture, I'm good, there's some load on me, but wait a minute. Uh, now I adopt an awkward posture. I bend down to lift an object. Just the bending down itself can triple the load on the spine. Awkward postures can also cause situations like in your wrist, if you're kind of rubbing your tendons along your flexor retinaculum and so forth, you could get kind of a friction going there and you know have, have potentially some fretting fatigue. So usually when you adopt a non-neutral posture, you are increasing stress on the body in some way. When in a neutral posture, you're, you're, in, you're generally in pretty good shape and you're limiting your loads, but when you're adopting awkward postures, you're seeing an increase in this. So, so that's another risk factor that we think kind of is part of this overall look at um, overall kind of paradigm of, in fatigue failure. What about vibration? Well, vibration also involves force and repetition. And it also involves a few other things like resonant frequencies and that kind of thing. But vibration is a very common, uh, very commonly looked at by engineers using fatigue failure techniques as a result. So if you look at all the four risk factors, physical risk factors we've talked about for musculoskeletal disorders, they could all fit into this same paradigm that it's all a fatigue failure process that we're seeing. We're just see seeing different manifestations of it. All right, so using fatigue failure principles to ascertain musculoskeletal disorder risk. All right, so like I said, you know, our previous tools have not done very well at looking at say, okay, somebody has sort of a moderate load for a while, and then they have a light load for a while, and then they do a really heavy job, and they get really highly stressed for a while. It's like, how do you combine these into a, into a kind of a single metric? It's like, you know, people really had no clue before. But fatigue failure has a technique called the Palmgren Minor Rule, which will allow you to kind of say, okay, at maybe 60% of your ultimate strength, you might be able to have a thousand cycles to failure. Let's say you did 15 during a work day at that level. And you did uh, 100 at 50% ultimate strength, where you could have 10,000 cycles till failure. And at the 40% level, well, you could do 100,000 at that level and you, and you did 700 cycles there. Well, the way that we can kind of add this up and get to a single measure of cumulative damage is to take the 15 cycles experienced over the 1,000, add the 100 over the 10,000, plus 700 divided by the 100,000. And just that simple calculation can get us to some measure, and this would be kind of, think of it kind of as, as 3% of the way to fatigue failure. Okay, and notice that, you know, we've had people like kind of focus on repetition, for example, as, a, as an independent risk factor. Well, if we look at repetition, this, this 700 would be the worst situation, right? But because so many more cycles are allowed you know, before failure would occur, that, that's actually about half the risk associated with the 15 cycles at 60% ultimate strength, okay? So, so this is a method that, that can be used and we are actually using this in some of the risk assessment tools that we've come up with, which I'll be talking about later. 
Um, so, so uh, people in the past had used kind of an area under the curve technique for developing cumulative uh, damage assessment, and cumulative risk, but and they kind of kind of uh, said, okay, how much loading times how much of a load? So this is like, uh, didn't mean to do that. This is three seconds of loading at 150 newtons. You do that three times. Or you could do 900 newtons worth of load times one and a half seconds. You would, in both cases, you would end up with 1,350 newton seconds worth of load. So those would be equivalent using an area under the curve technique. But, you know, you can only do about you know, at that level, you probably only do about 15 or 20 cycles before failure in this situation. And you could probably do hundreds of thousands or millions of those before, before, uh, before failure. So we don't really think this area under the curve idea is, is very good in terms of getting, getting a uh, kind of a cumulative damage. The Palmgren minor rule we think does a lot better. All right, some of the things that haven't been really uh, talked about in our field as well is like the influence of stress range and how stress range really drives the development of injury in these, uh, in these disorders. So if we look at and assess using fatigue failure techniques, what the risk associated with these various loadings is going to be. Okay, so we can take a look at this one kind of, this is a loading at a very low level. Then we've got this kind of really one high, uh, you know, high stress range re reversal. And then we have a few reversals at a, at a very high range. So which are going to be the, the most significant ones? Well, this one is obviously not going to account for very much damage, you know, low, low cycle, um, very low stress range. So less than a, a thousandth of a percent of the total. This one high stress range activity would account for 77% of the damage in this example. So even though you have you know, several cycles up in this range, the stress range here is, is, is lower. And actually you would do less damage in this circumstance compared to that, to that one large stress event. Okay, so but what what would happen to muscles if you're if you're working at, at kind of a really high level like that? It would fatigue. So, you know, this this might be better, you know, in terms of uh, in in terms of the fatigue failure thing, but but with the muscles fatiguing and stuff like that, you might not be able to work like that very long. So even though there's a small stress range here, the muscles are at high enough level that they're probably going to fatigue and not going to be able to do that. So what's going to happen? They're, they're going to want to rest. And so we're going to have a big stress range reversal to the, to the negative side or to the, to the low side, which is actually going to be worse for the tissues. So, um, so at any rate, but we can kind of take a look at these things, look at the stress range and its importance in terms of the development of, of fatigue failure damage. All right, so the difference and kind of the exciting thing and the, and the really frustrating thing at the same time associated with, with this is that, you know, our, our tissues can heal. Now, how fast do they heal? How well do they heal? Well, that, that, that's based upon a lot, of, uh, a lot of factors. You know, if you get older, you can't heal as well. You know, there's some differences between genders in terms of, in terms of healing. But, but you know, the, the fatigue failure model allows for this. And in fact, you know, this, this was actually kind of blows my mind. This was like back in like 65 or something like that. This, a guy named Nash came up with this equation. 
uh, and it was actually he had two versions of it. One was that the total tissue damage is going to be equal to the damage due to stress, which is that kind of fatigue failure of Palmgren Meyer, uh, you know, example that I showed. Uh, and then he also included damage due to aging and damage due to disease, and then minus the healing that can occur at the tissue. So if you're talking about a time that's fairly limited in scope, you know, aging isn't going to be a big issue. And disease, you know, we'll say disease is not a big issue. So you can kind of boil this down to the total amount of tissue damage is going to be equal to the damage due to the mechanical stress minus whatever healing can take place. So, and this is where this damage due to mechanical stress is the sum of the palmgren uh equation. If the teeth is really happening, individual characteristics are going to play a big role in who gets hurt. And this is probably a kind of a politically sensitive thing. You know, NIOSH doesn't like, you know, you know, industry likes to use young, strong workers to do the heavy materials handling tasks. And NIOSH would like for anybody to be able to do, you know, these types of jobs. But in fact, you know, those young, strong workers are probably better suited. They have stronger tissue. You know, their, you know, their backs are going to be stronger, their spines are going to be stronger, their muscles are going to be stronger, their tendons. So a large, young worker is probably going to be better suited to doing materials handling tasks. And, and you know, it's kind of maybe an unfortunate thing, but it's just kind of the, the way the world works, I think. So let's take a look at, so let's say that somebody's ultimate tendon uh, stress was at uh, 75 megapascals. And, and they're exposed to a 30 megapascal stress during, uh, during a work task. And let's say that task is done 200 times during the day. Well, if they have an ultimate uh, strength of 75 MPA, they're going to be working at about 40% of their tissue uh, tendon strength. Predicted cycles to failure would be about 100,000. The number of, uh, the percent of damage done in 200 cycles is going to be about 0.2%. As this worker ages, his tendon strength is going to go down to maybe 60 MPA. Now he's working, if he does the same job, at 50% of his ultimate strength, fewer cycles to failure, and a higher percentage of damage being done by the same task. And of course, he keeps going, uh, getting older, and he has a lower tendon ultimate strength. Maybe he's at 60% then the same job, you know, instead of doing 0.2% of damage, is going to do approximately 20% of the damage necessary to develop fatigue failure. So, you know, gender differences, anthropometric differences, age differences, these are all going to play a big role in terms of how fast people are going to experience injuries when exposed to loads. Okay, so the other implication is the uh, development of risk assessment tools based on fatigue failure principles. And so we've, we've developed two tools kind of in the past like year and a half or so. One is called LIFT, and this is the lifting fatigue failure tool. And it's to assess cumulative loading associated with lifting tasks out in industry. We also developed one for the upper extremity because these are kind of the two main, I guess there are three main ones. The shoulder would be the one that's not covered by these, but you know, certainly low back injuries and upper extremity injuries, especially wrist, elbow, et cetera, are, are two of the big drivers in terms of the cost of musculoskeletal disorders in industry. So we tried to make these really simple so that Kind of any safety manager could, could kind of do 
do the task and do the do the assessment. Uh, and for the lift tool, all we need to have inputted for each task uh, that's evaluated is the weight of the load and the peak horizontal distance from the hip to the center of the load during the lift. So that's just kind of we're trying to get what the moment is due to the load that they're being that they're lifting. So just the distance here, how much does it weigh? And then how many times do you do that lift a day? And then you can do you know multiple tasks, you know, multiple lifting tasks. You can do this assessment for all of them. Okay, here's how you take the measurement. So we don't want it, we want it, you know, the horizontal distance, the peak horizontal distance to the load. And so we might end up with something like this. Okay, we have a situation where we've got a, a 12 inch lever arm, so pretty close to the body, 20 pound load, 75 repetitions of that. And we would give you kind of a cumulative damage score of point zero 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 three. We might have another one, uh, you know, this 20 uh, inches away, a 40 pound load that's being lifted. It's done 120 times a day. We would give you, you know, cumulative damage score. And we actually can evaluate all the tasks and we can tell you based on the fatigue failure principles, what percentage of the total damage is being caused by each task. For example, in this one, the third task accounts for 65% of the total damage that's being done during the workday. So obviously, if you're going to be looking at these jobs and saying, which one do I need to redesign? You want to redesign the one that's, that accounts for two thirds of the damage that's being done during the workday. And this other one here is about 20%. And the others are actually pretty small. Those are pretty reasonable. But, but this kind of allows you to, to look at tasks, look at the cumulative load. And you know, we can actually, we've evaluated this against epidemiological databases. And we would say that the estimated you know, kind of risk associated with this job would be about 40, 43%. Kind of we're giving it an orange rating orangish we kind of color map this so the green is is fairly safe you know then ye you know, yellow is worse and yellow orange is worse and red is the worst okay so so at any rate we validated this this tool and yes and we think it's pretty simple you know you can go through a through a plant pretty quickly and get all your jobs done on this so we tested against a, a database that was developed for the lumbar motion monitor um, which is a kind of a goniometer that you strap to your back and it follows your motions and stuff like that. But they had what we needed. They, they looked at monotask jobs in this case, and they had the peak load moment, which is what we use, and they had the frequency of lifting, which we also used. We also tested against the automotive database. It tested out very well against that as well. But uh, for the LMM, you know, we did a logistic regression model. We found that our chi-square was, was 62.22, highly significant, an odds ratio of 2.78. That, that means that for every, uh, we're using the log of the cumulative damage measure that, that we calculate. That means that for every increase in magnitude, there would be a 2.78 times increase in risk. And this is what the relationship looks like when you plot it out. This is what you know the logistic regression plots out. So, so this is our log uh, lift cumulative damage measure, and you see as our log lift cumulative damage measure increases, you see that there's a you know strong increase in the risk of uh, low back disorders. Okay, we did a very similar thing with our upper extremity tool. And we used a database, a uh, very nice database that was developed by Schechtman and Batter um, back in 1977. And what they did was they, they kind of developed a, 
a fatigue failure curve. This is a log scale, so it doesn't look like the same curve that I showed you before, but it's, but it's basically the same, looking at how tendons react to different levels of loading. So we use that, that data and, a, and a, an equation that they came up with, looking at the stress and the, the number of cycles. And what we did was that we mapped that to, to different perceived exertion levels. So, so we have a scale, it's actually uh, the OmniRes scale. So it goes from zero to 10, where zero is very light, 10 is very hard, and you got these other levels in between. Uh, we kind of uh, took those and we, we weighted, when we did repetitions at a very light condition, you know, the multiplier for every repetition is very small. And then it gets larger and larger, you know, exponentially larger and larger, the higher the rating of perceived exertion is. Okay, so we didn't have a good thing like the moment, you know, that's more, a little more quantitative. This is a little more judgmental, but we, you know, when we've tested it, it against epidemiology databases, it also proved out very nicely. So, so in a, in a similar manner uh, that we had with lift tool, okay, we would first of all pick a level of exertion on the scale, perceived exertion. So this is an easy task. Let's say we did 960 repetitions. This would be our cumulative damage. And in this case, we would have that, that first task would be associated with 6.3% of the total damage. Uh, we have a somewhat easy one. We did 480 of those you know, that would account for about 28.6, and we did some somewhat hard, we did 120, that accounts for 65% of the total damage dur done during the workday. So, and in total, we would have kind of a 33% risk of, of injury. So, we like to deal in terms of the probabilities for both lift and duet. So what's the probability of injury? We can actually do this because we've been able to test it against epidemiology data. Are you willing to live, live with 33% risk of injury? If so, you know, maybe you don't need to change these tests, but if you want to get down to 20% you know, risk of injury, you know, obviously you would want to kind of take a look at this, this job that had the somewhat hard rating. So we validated this one against an epidemiology study. There were six plants associated with a large automotive manufacturer in the United States. And we had 772 participants working in 500 unique jobs. The thing that was a little different with this uh, validation was that we had multiple tasks being done by lots of these workers. So they might've been doing one job, they might've been doing two, they might've been doing up to four different jobs during the day. And we summed all those, you know, according to uh, the methods that you use in fatigue fair methods. And so, again, we looked at our log CD measure. We find very significant chi-square, you know, pretty high odds ratio in unadjusted measures. And then we also, for this one, adjusted for, for site, gender, age, and BMI. And we still find that the log CD measure is, is highly significant in terms of uh, upper extremity disorders. And again, with our duet validation, this was the result of the logistic regression model. And as you increase the log CD, you see a straight increase in the probability of injury. Okay, I'm not gonna go through that, but I'm just gonna leave you with, okay, so we, we've, we've got these tools online. They're fairly simple to use. Uh, they're, uh, one's Lyft, so lifft.pythonanywhere.com. And the upper extremity tool is duet.pythonanywhere.com. So, so those are available. If you're interested, you can play around with them, so forth. So. That's, I took a little too much time, but i uh, be happy to, to address any questions that you might have.
both of those models, you're perceiving some ultimate strength. But do you, like, do you input the characters for like an age of the, the worker, or how is it kind of scaled according to what the perceived tissue strength would be? Right. So for this, you know, recall that you know we're we're really trying to make this easy for you know practitioners to use. Um, so the way that we did that was we kind of came up with kind of an average, took an average person, got compressive estimates for that, and then we compare them against an average spine value. So we, uh, you know, we've got other models that we've actually done that, that we've said, okay, what if it's a 20 year old worker versus a 40 year old worker? Uh, you know, we know that there's a difference in spine strength there. We've got data that we can, that we can do that with. For these tools, we felt that that was kind of too much. You know, the every time you add kind of one thing like that, it it kind of exponentially ex, ex, expands the stuff that you've got to input and whatever. So, uh, you know, we do have those kind of those mo those other models that kind of incorporate age, anthropometry, and gender. Uh, but we didn't, you know, for for this particular application we didn't want to do that so we'd kind of use kind of averages yeah, Colin. yeah have you have you applied this to like an industrial setting after you validated it did it if you have did it kind of show a reduction in, in overuse injuries well i mean we validated it we came up with it and we didn't use the epidemiology to come up with it with the with the model so we had this this epidemiology you know we knew we had this epidemiology ba database but we came up with a model and we tested it against that that database now one thing we want to do is we want to you know test this prospectively uh we have not had the opportunity to do that yet i mean these are really pretty new tools uh so no we we haven't done that but but we feel that you know having developed the model first you know without looking at the epi data and then we you know, test it against that epi data, uh, it matches very nicely. And so, so we're encouraged by that. But, but yeah, there's a lot more work to do on these. Yeah. Yes. So, quick clarification question. You said there are gender differences in healing. Do males or females heal more easily? Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I, males, I think, tend to heal a little faster than females in general. Walton, back to you. Yes. What's that? I'm just thinking how you formulate it. Well, first of all, I'm very happy that you talked about biology, because we have uh, a lot of people that look at injuries, primarily in sport and often in running. And whenever I hear talks here, it's all about the mechanics. And I've always thought, you know, what about the biology? You know, because I know two people run exactly the same training and one gets injured all the time, the other one does not. So in your ergonomic situation, how much do you think the mechanics determines whether or not workers get injured doing a certain task and how much it's their biology you feel the mechanics is much more important, or the biology is much more important, or, or the heat core? I think we don't know, but I would say that the mechanical damage is, is playing a major role in this, in this whole process. Now, you know, the, the, the biological stuff is important, and the, the, you know, the healing rate. See, unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that we see in industry is that tendons are getting damaged, you know, cartilage is getting damaged. Uh, we're seeing, you know, spines getting damaged. These are tissues that don't tend to heal very well. You know, so tendons, you know, have like what, what one seventh the blood supply of muscle. I mean, they, they just don't get very much perfusion. It takes them a long time to heal as a result. Um, so I think that the mechanical loading, if you mechanically load enough, you're gonna be able to overcome any any you know healing rate because there, there's a there's definitely a limit to the healing rate that can be that can be uh experienced by by these tissues and, and yeah 
So we have two runners, and they run 10 kilometers five days a week. The one gets injured all the time, the other one may not. Or you have two workers at the airport, and they all transport uh, you know, uh, 20 airplanes full of loads every day, and the one gets injured all the time, the other one does not. Do you think it has to do with the mechanics of how these people hmm. run, or how they live? What do you think it has to do with the biology? Well, it could be, you know, it could be, you know, well, let's say, I mean, I think that there, there are certainly biological issues. I mean, some people, you know, have stronger tissues. Some people, you know, have uh, better healing mechanisms. You know, one kind of interesting thing to me is that, you know, in terms of healing these tissues, one thing that's really important is, is getting into stage four sleep at night getting into very deep sleep. Because when you're in deep sleep, you get a bolus of growth factors. You don't get it unless you get into stage four sleep. You get a bolus of growth factors which are important in healing musculoskeletal tissues. So that's a biological, you know, kind of factor. Maybe some people are light sleepers. You know, others are deeper sleepers. And they get the healing uh, that that the people who aren't getting the good sleep, you know, are not getting. And so, you know, that's one biological thing. Certainly, you know, I think age, gender, you know, those, those other things can have biological impacts on, on the development of injuries. So, so I, you know, so I think they're, they're both important. And I don't think we understand we don't understand the importance, the relative importance very well yet. You know, yeah. What is a 33% injury risk? Well, that would mean, uh, in this case, <clears throat> it would mean a 33% that somebody would have a medical visit, you know, during the, during, during the year uh, when they're exposed to this, this task. 33% injuries means I have a one-third chance of getting injured once per year. Yeah, yeah. In this case, it was visiting a medical clinic okay. for symptoms. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Arash? I was wondering about the effect of training. So when a worker just started the job, so they might not be fitted for the job for their muscles or every other thing. So do, do you or should you operate the uh, effect of training in this program or not? Well, it's a good question. I mean, so training and, and training can mean different, different kinds of things. Do we teach people to lift smoothly or that kind of thing? You know, there's also a training that you're going to get, physical training that you're going to get from, from doing the job if you're doing a heavy lifting job and that kind of thing. And you can, you can actually load your tissues you can do weightlifting and actually increase your your muscle strength, your tendon strength, and all that kind of stuff. So if you do a lot of you know fairly high load but low repetition stuff, and you get enough rest, you actually get stronger tissues. So that's that's a kind of strength training effect that you can have. You know, and I think that those things are that are important. You know, obviously you can do a, a limited number of kind of kind of high stress things and be okay and actually be better. But, you know, if you keep doing that, say your job requires you to do that, but lots more times than, you know, a total of 30 reps or something like that, you know, you're going to get damaged at some point. There's some kind of threshold where, hey, well, you've overloaded yourself and you haven't done it too much that you haven't done a lot of damage and your, your tissues can actually heal. But on the other hand, uh, you know, if you do lots of those, lots more of those, you know, you could end up in a situation where you're actually doing damage to the tissues. So our, our tissues, one of the very interesting things I think is that our tissues are very dynamic. If you sit around and watch TV, you're going to, you know, get weaker. You know, tissues are gonna, gonna atrophy. Whereas, you know, if you go up into this, you know, space station, you know, you're gonna lose muscle and bone at an incredible clip because they're not stressed. If you stress them in the proper way, you can make them stronger. But if you stress them in an improper way, you can, you can do damage to them. So, 
that's kind of a couple of thoughts about about training. So did you say that uh, males heal faster than females? Is that what you said? Yes. So what's what's the evidence for that? Uh, I can't quote it right now, but I believe I've seen that in the literature. Do you remember what based on what at least what parameters were considered to make such a conclusion? Well, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I can't quote it for you right now, but, but one thing that, that's, that's pretty clear is that, that, that women have more musculoskeletal injuries than men do in, in occupational tasks. Uh, their their rates for carpal tunnel and and other sorts of disorders are are much higher, and I think in in some of those studies I've kind of um, seen that they 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 heal a little bit slower. They also have kind of different uh, tendon strength. You know, apparently the female hormones do have a have an impact on on this on the strength of tissues. And so, so there's, there are differences between the genders in, in the loading and, and in the healing. It's so my what, understanding. What I know is that actually women are more protected against muscle damage than, than men. What's that? Women are more protected against muscle damage than men are. Uh, but that, that, I understand it's a different topic, but so at least for the muscle damage, I'm thinking about the connective tissue with the muscle damage, I would have said the opposition. Okay. I understand it's a different. Right, right. Uh, the, I think uh, in the module was very similar to engineering materials like steel or something. Yes. Uh, uh, I was wondering that how the viscoelastic properties or recovery properties of muscles or the soft tissues will affect the static behavior. Uh, they will. They will affect it. Um, so, and I didn't get all of the things. You know, you talked about the viscoelastic properties. You know, uh, obviously those are those are going to have an impact. You know, I was talking with Brent the other day, and he was like, "Well, in the in the range of physiological loading, it it may not have that huge an effect, but certainly they, all of our tissues are viscoelastic in nature, and so they're going to have changes due to the load rate that they're that they're stressed at and that kind of thing. So so um, yeah, those those types of things are definitely going to have an impact. Yeah, there were a couple of things that surprised me about your uh, equations that you show, you know, the predictive equations. And uh, actually, the one was just mentioned that stress rate was never mentioned, but let's not do that. The, the other thing that I was uh, surprised was when you had the variable loading, then you kind of add them up. And so it seemed to me that's commutative. And I was wondering if that's actually correct. So if I do a light lifting at the beginning, and then I go to heavier lifting, and then I go to heavier lifting, very heavy lifting. Is that the same as doing the heavy lifting first and then going to the, I, I would have assumed that this equation would not be commutative, but in your case it is. Yes, so we don't take that into account, and our, our data you know, does very well against the epidemiology stuff, but <clears throat> there, you know, I, I have seen both, uh, uh, statements made that heavy loading first leads to quicker fatigue failure and that lower loading first and then heavier leads to quicker fatigue failure. So I, I'm not you know certain exactly what kind of impact that has. That there are some people that believe that there are loading effects but um, but like I said I've seen both statements made and so I'm not clear on exactly. Have people ever done that? You know with isolated tissues like tendon and you load them heavy first and then less and then less, or you do it your way around and see how many cycles. I've, I've never seen that. <laughs> it's pretty, there's an there's a established fatigue testing protocol called a uh, two step fatigue approach, and it's done for engineering materials. But I've seen one study once that did it for bone, uh, where you go, they, they looked at high, they, they were testing this theory of whether it was commutative or not. So they went high to low, and then they went low to high. And uh, no, it's not. The low is high to low, that seems bad, according to them. So anyway, the high to low is worse. Yeah. And low to the high to low yeah. in this study. But that's what I kind of guess. But the other thing about the equations that surprised me is that you put in 
the numbers of repetitions per day. And I was wondering, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lift 420 times a day, but you know, in one case, you know, again, I'm at the airport, and, and I'm doing them all in half an hour or an hour, and then I'm getting a rest or no airplane comes anymore, whereas I'm getting a delivery every five minutes and I'm doing, doing it over the entire day. And, and that doesn't seem to be captured either, like the density of how you do that. Well, it's, it's true, and I don't think we understand very much about very much about that certainly we've never and we don't see a lot of loading like that in you know biological testing of, of tissues I mean, we don't load them like that you know here's you know five minutes you know do a lot and then let it rest for a long time and then five minutes. and we don't know how materials fail like that um so you know i would i would say that you know all of those things Know, probably play a role to some degree or another but but really the stress range seems to drive a lot and we don't really understand the effect of short-term rest on on musculoskeletal injuries I mean there just have not been a lot of studies that have been done that have actually looked at that it's like uh, what if somebody's doing something for you know you know, and he does it like for a second and has a bit bit of a break versus, you know, if he has to hold it for, for four seconds and then has a shorter break, what impact does that have? You know, uh, your guess is as good as mine on that because I, I don't think we have any data that really establishes that. We don't understand what's happening. We, you know, I believe that there's a couple of different kinds of rest. One's the long kind of rest where you're sleeping, you're off the job, you know, your your tissues are not being stressed and you know that's one type of rest the other type of rest is the rest that you would get kind of the micro rest that you would get during the work day and like you said there may be some long you know rests during the work day for somebody who unloads planes and stuff like that they may you know have 10 minutes of high in intensity lifting and then you know be 20 minutes before the next plane gets in and, they, and then they do it again all i can tell you is you know, what we validated against were jobs that were highly variable in nature. And so, so they had different periods of rest. They had, you know, different kind of periods in which they were being loaded. You know, just kind of knowing the amount of load and the number of repetitions does a lot for you in terms of understanding, you know, what the risk is going to be. The rest thing is something that is is going to need a lot of a lot of additional research because I don't think we understand it's that. Maybe not so important. Then, you argue. Well, I I would say you do pretty well without that information. You know, our models show that you, you can you can explain a lot without that information. I'm sure we could explain more if we understood that, but but we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, near the end of your talk, uh, you incorporated BMI into your model, and I'm wondering what that changed. Uh, was it uh, an assumed change in the tissue properties or uh, an added load uh, to the joints and tissues? Uh, I don't remember. Was, uh, was there, that in there? Uh, yeah, there was something with BMI and uh, a p-value when you were validating your studies. Oh, oh yeah. Well, that was, you know, we were controlling for certain factors that have been shown to have uh, effects on injury in the past. Uh, when we controlled for it here, BMI was not significant. A lot of times you'll see BMI is significant. In fact, if you look at those, <clears throat> if you look at those slides, the site had a big impact. You know, these are all gender, age, and BMI are all things that have been shown to have an influence in the past. But when you you know are just looking at the log CD and the and the you know the the site had a big difference. Like I said. These actually, none of these ended up being significantly different. We sometimes saw that um, that uh, gender played a little bit of an issue uh, in, in some of the other you know data that we've collected that we've tested it against. But um, in this case, BMI, you know, we controlled for it. So this log CD chi square odd ratio is free from the influence of BMI. About the effect of chronic diseases like diabetes in humans, because 
For example, uh, advanced glycation and products are related to diabetes and um, that they tr can cr trigger the loss of regenerative capacity in collagen tissues. And also, uh, they can be found even in high-level athletes. Sure. Um, you know, again, we didn't incorporate that in, in our model. You know, I know that the diabetes, you know, is a risk factor for a lot of musculoskeletal tissues. You know, uh, carpal tunnel is, is, is a lot higher in, in diabetics and stuff like that. So, you know, the diabetes definitely has a, has a toll in terms of musculoskeletal disorders. We didn't include any, any, uh, any, any kind of chronic disease information with these. But again, I mean, it's, it's a good question and, and certainly there's indication that there would be higher risk for people with those kinds of disease states. Yeah. So I potentially have a two-part question. So have you ever uh, had your research change some of the NIOSH guidelines? Well, I think it is now. Okay. Um, they're, they're actually looking at, at doing a kind of a new lifting guide. and. Um, they actually hired one of our PhD students, and she's going to be kind of primarily associated with this, and and I think that they're very interested in in, in this approach. Yeah, and so, if they do change the guidelines, like what do you do in that scenario? Is it you have to come and place with something that's better? Because, like, say for example, uh, like a union worker would get part of that and say, like, well, we've been working under guidelines this entire time that have actually been wrong. So then how do you kind of navigate that where you find out the guidelines that they've been working on have been poor to start with? So. Well, I mean, that's, that's the case in, in many, uh, you know, many times when you're, you know, you're coming up with, a, with kind of a new method and stuff like that. The old method was the one that was like, well, it worked okay, but it's not working as well as, as what we're proposing here. You know, what do you do in those cases? Well, you say, I think you say goodbye to the old methods and you say hello to the new methods. And, you know, certainly we've got a lot more work to do here, but, but, the, but the indications are just, you know, we've, we've looked at, at, at modeling and we've, we've tested this stuff about, against a bunch of databases, in, including one pros, prospective database for the Duet tool, where we showed a dose-response relationship, and that's that's kind of uh, that'll be coming out in the in the in the not too distant future. So you measure things with the duet beforehand, follow people. You see a dose-response relationship in terms of the log CD measure and and the and the risk. We've tested against so many things now that it's like if this model doesn't work on your injury data, I think your data is wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's really, we've, we've kind of gotten to that point because, in fact, we did, in, in one case, we saw that, that it, it didn't work and we were like, what's going on? We went and looked in the data and there were some transcription errors in the data. And when we fixed it, the model fit. I mean, it, it's, been, it's been kind of any researcher's dream, really. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting results that are just, that are just uh, you know, very, very nice. So, so I think you know, I'm hoping that NIOSH will kind of look to that. And other things, there was a recent paper that was talking about ISO standards and how they're not really based on that much science. And you know, people have been reviewing these. It's like, you know, what is this? You know, the, what is this really based on? You know, we need some stuff that's based on science. And I think that this provides us with a with a science science scientific mechanism for the etiology of these disorders that, you know, is, is potentially helpful in terms of developing those types of standards. Yes? Um, we just have an online question here, but he just says, this is Robert Griffiths, and he asks, do we know the risk of failure in materials engineering for the same number of oscillations, but at different frequencies of oscillations? Uh, so is it merely the number of oscillations, or does frequency matter? Uh, well, frequency matters. I mean, an oscillation is kind of like a frequency. So, so, yeah, I mean, frequency of loading matters. I, I don't know if he's talking about like whole body vibration types of stuff. 
with whole body vibration, a lot of times what you see is kind of a lower overall magnitude, but lots of repetitions. So both, you know, situations where you have low load and lots of repetitions and, you know, or higher loads and lower repetitions, you know, they can all lead to damage, potentially. Yes. So when you talk about fatigue failure, what, which part of the body that you, you are referring to? Is it the soft tissue, the heart tissue, or you know, like cartilage, or skeletal muscle, or bone? Like what are you actually referring to, or the mother tissue? All of them. All of them. Uh, I mean, you know, these these were made for you know primarily tendon injuries for the for the. Uh, Upper, our distal upper extremity, and for lifting tasks, you know, really concentrating on the spine. But, you know, there's only one known mechanism for the way that materials fail in repetitive loading, and that's fatigue failure. All materials do it. Any, you know, known material in the universe fails by means of fatigue failure. That's the only mechanism that we know of for materials that are repetitively loaded. And I think that all, all of our tissues are doing the, the same. But, uh, I'm curious because, you know, if you look at, say, spinal cord uh, uh, disc, you have a cartilage with bone underlying the, the cartilage, yeah. and they have different mechanical problems. So yes. I believe they have different ultimate tensile stress um, or the failure cycles. So how do you uh, reconcile those things <coughs> and then come up with this model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so with the spine, I mean, the, 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 yeah, the, the materials are definitely a lot different. For the spine, the first thing to go is going to be the vertebral end plate. There's no question about it. The disc is like 10 times stronger than the vertebral end plate. So the vertebral end plate goes, and, and that starts a process of degeneration. So in that process of degeneration, you know, you get, first of all, it, the cracks in the vertebral end plate will heal by a scar tissue which does not allow you know, the nutrition to go from the, from the uh, bone up through the end plate to the disc, which provides the disc its nutrition. So the disc starts to degenerate. And as it degenerates, it starts to have radial fissures out from the circumference. Uh, it's got a highly inflammatory uh, you know, material on the center of it as it gets out to the periphery and encounters some nerve. There, there's no nerves in the center but around the outer third of the annulus, there are some nerve fibers. You know, as they contact those, you'll get pain and you'll get chronic pain from that. So, so that, you know, um, so in, in some situations, it's not just the one material that gets failed first, but it's, it's kind of the process that, that it institutes that I think kind of creates the problem. You know, as you can continue to load these things, you know, we continue to load ourselves every day, and you know eventually you're going to have some deterioration, some degeneration associated with the with all tissues. I guess my question would be, um, which number of cycles that the uh, ultimate number of cycles that you are referring to? Which one you are taking from? Is it from the end plate or from the cartilage or from the bone? It's from the end plate mostly for this. So you choose, you pick the weakest part, and then you take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah because that's really instituting the, the process. Is there any other questions? No, let's take them again. Okay. All right, please um, come back next week, next Thursday, same time, 3 p.m. We have uh, Andres Croker. he's a PhD